dragons, light, raiders, light raiders, one shepherd boy with four companions, plus a talking silver wolf, begin their quest to restore the light raider order, destroy a portal, and stop an invasion. So begins novelist James R. Hannibal's Light Raider Academy series, book one, Wolf Soldier. It is releasing Tuesday, October 26. We are hosting James again to explore this new young adult fantasy. Welcome again to Fantastical Truth, the podcast from Lorehaven. Thank you for joining this quest to find the best of Christian-made fantasy, science fiction, and beyond and apply the meanings of these stories to the real world that our author, Jesus Christ, calls us to serve. I'm E. Stephen Burnett, Lorehaven's publisher. I'm also the co-author of a nonfiction book about fiction called The Pop Culture Parent. Zach is absent this recording, a rare exception. Unfortunately, I got some rather desperate texts from him, uh, probably on a bugged line. I think he delved too deep and too greedily into government secrets. Uh, and is being held at a secure facility in Area 51. However, we're confident he will work things out and convince them that he didn't see anything really, uh, and perhaps uh, at some point the men in black will return him to our care. Oh, by the way, this is episode 85. What if you joined a quest to defeat goblins, trolls, and ancient invaders? Featuring Wolf Soldier author James R. Hannibal. Just a little sci-fi before we get back into the more traditional fantasy of this amazing story, Uh, which is publishing on the date of this podcast episode's release, Tuesday, October 26th. Before we introduce James, who's been on the podcast before, by the way, episode 70, we have our first sponsor, Andrew J. Chamberlain, again, uh, another science fiction author. His book is called The Centauri Survivors, and its description is, and I quote, When a habitable planet is discovered just four light years from Earth, Governments and private corporations rush to build a ship to take the first humans there. But only a few of the colonists wake up from cryosleep after the 60-year journey. And as their ship comes into orbit around the new planet, they find themselves surrounded by death. As the survivors scramble to make sense of what has happened, they find their own lives under threat. And pursued by their enemies, they escape to the surface of the new planet. Caught between their human adversaries and whatever the planet throws at them, The survivors fight to stay alive as circumstances drive them towards a final deadly confrontation. This is book one of the Centauri Sequence series about which a reader says, This gripping piece of fiction, well written and worth recommending. Sounds like it, and you can find that link in our show notes for episode 85 and get more information, including more links and the novel cover at lorehaven.com slash podcast sponsors. From there, I'm hearing a a gentle mechanical whir augmented by uh, some sort of magical force. I think James R. Hannibal might be waiting to enter the recording studio. I shall go open the portal this instant. James has returned to Fantastical Truth uh, by means of a magical wheelchair. Stay tuned to find out why he chose that particular vehicle as opposed to his other favorites. He's a former stealth pilot and no stranger to secrets and adventure. He's been shot at, locked up by surface-to-air missiles, has hunted insurgents with drones, and was once chased by an armed terrorist down a winding German road. James is the Carol Award-winning author of the Clandestine Service series and a three-time winner of the Silver Falcon Award for Juvenile Fiction for his Section 13 series. He's now also the author of Wolf Soldier, which launches on Tuesday, October 26th from Enclave Publishing. And he stewards the discipleship learning system game that will be relaunched as Light Raiders. James, glad to have you back here. And what has confined you to a wheelchair at this time, however magical? Hey, thank you for bringing me back on. I am excited to be here. Um, So uh, walking, which is my primary way of writing, I walk and I dictate into my phone, uh, combined with uh, some heavy walking this summer in my day job in the transportation, air transportation industry, has created stress fractures in multiple bones in my feet. And so the doctor has confined me to a wheelchair for the next seven weeks. And that's why I'm driving around on this wonderful motorized chair that I found on Craigslist. Yeah, he's sitting here looking like a Professor X uh, riding around in the wheelchair. He's got his index figure touched to his brain for some reason. So you can know that he's using his brain or at least trying to. We need to pray for James that he will be able to work on book two now of the uh, Light Raider Academy series. 
we've gone over some of this, uh, James, mainly talking about the backstory of the Dragon Raid game, the discipleship learning adventure. I think Zach and I noted afterwards uh, that we had uh, found out that now that means that you've had experience with both versions of the RPG acronym, uh, most likely both rocket propelled grenades and role playing games. Just real quick, though, uh, can we go over your backstory personally, uh, how you found biblical faith and fantastical stories uh, and then also became an author of military fiction uh, and this uh, Sherlock Holmes type of spinoff uh, series, as well as uh, leading to Wolf Soldier. We'll get the Wolf Soldier next. So my backstory, pastor's kid from Colorado Springs, a chaplain's kid, actually. So traveled around uh, with a military dad uh, who was also a pastor and uh, really tested out lots of different youth discipleship programs. Uh, but uh, and oddly enough, not really coincidentally, Dragon Raid was the one that's, that stuck with me, which is how long story ending, I ended up uh, taking over to carry it forward to a new generation as Light Raiders. But was surrounded by the, the church and folks in the faith from the get-go. So um, I was God put me in a, a wonderful family for discipleship and, and learning. And uh, so that has informed my faith, but also a family that's very open to fantasy and science fiction. My dad's a huge Star Trek lover and Tolkien lover. My mom, too, uh, not as much the Star Trek. And uh, and so that, you know, combine those two, I've always loved fantasy writing. So my first short story was published uh, by being read on the radio when I was 12, and I ran with it from there. We recently had a sponsorship from uh, your publisher, uh, Revel Books, uh, one of your publishers uh, for uh, your recent novel, uh, I believe it's called The Paris, the Paris, I want to say Paris Accords, Paris Conspiracy, something like that. The, the uh, that Paris was your, betrayal. The Paris Betrayal. Uh, that was, uh, you described that as the, the book of Job. Uh, and as far as I could tell, meets meets Jason Bourne. Uh, that's one of your <laughs> that's, many. That's an apt description. Yeah. Basically it. Yes. Uh, the, the guy is like betrayed and, you know, has his whole spy game taken away from him. So little Mission Impossible type stuff there. So that's some of what you write in is uh, not just, you know, kind of middle grade mystery series or even the fantasy wolf soldier, but these uh, military suspense thrillers. Like, how did you get into creating those kinds of stories in addition to the more fantastical novels that you've created? The further that my military career went on, the deeper I got into covert style operations, I wound up working in the uh, stealth bomber, both in and out of the flight deck, doing some really interesting things. And so my military career informed the first writing that I did for big publishers. And I wrote in the Clancy genre with uh, Penguin Random House. Uh, before I began writing for kids. Uh, in fact, I wrote for that in that in that genre for a long time, uh, thinking that's where I had to write because that was where my street cred came from as somebody who had worked in that arena. But then my wife convinced me to write uh, for middle grade, specifically uh, middle grade boys, because there was a lack of, of great stories out there for uh, us to hand to our kids when they were that age. And then uh, really loved writing in that in that genre. It was always my first love. And so writing now, you know, with Dragon Raid and Light Raiders in the fantasy realm. Um, but we also have uh, some great spy stories that I continue to work with uh, Ravel on those. And uh, we actually have a mystery, uh, not really a spy story, but a, a more procedural mystery set in Maui coming out next year. Oh, wow. Okay. So you're, I mean, you are all over the place, which by the way, the professionals say you're not supposed to be able to do. You are either military suspense writer James R. Hannibal or you are YA fantasy writer James R. Hannibal, and ne'er the twain should meet. How are you getting away with this? I don't know. I don't follow those <laughs> rules. Uh, <laughs> I just write the stories that I love and that, and that God gives me to tell. He's like one of those Top Gun characters, folks. He's just breaking all the rules. You know, stealth pilot, they just, they just break all the rules. gone rogue. Yes, and they wear sunglasses and walk around and play volleyball and whatever it is they do. I don't know. I haven't seen Top Gun. That was before my, uh, my consciousness of popular Nobody culture. Nobody wants me to play volleyball with my shirt off. Yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> right now, you're play not playing much of anything. What, what's your recovery <laughs> time for the foot pain going on? See, I would have thought that maybe... Uh, there's a backstory there. You were literally out trying to fight dragons, and that takes a toll uh, on its feet. When you're when you're questing so hard on all of these paths, uh, that can really be a, a podiatry challenge situation. So, how I'm what's claiming your... that it's my early martial arts training? Um, I did. I did. I am a black belt in multiple martial arts. There we and, go. And when I was a younger man, we used to beat our bones uh, against boards 
in order to toughen up the bones. And I did a lot of uh, that kind of thing with my feet. They've been broken many times. And I think that has actually misshapen my feet enough uh, that all this walking is what stre- caused the stress fractures. Martial arts but, or know, dancing, they, us, they look you know, great. The, but In the martial arts that we were toughening up our bones, apparently mm-hmm. it didn't work. <laughs> well, either that or maybe you would have broken or harmed your feet much earlier. So what what is your expected recovery time from this? About uh, <clears throat> uh, seven weeks starting a week and a half ago. Okay, so Merry Christmas. Here's your feet back, maybe. <laughs> So meanwhile, uh, what led you to create in the world of Light Raiders? I mean, you've already touched some on Dragon Raid in our last episode, episode 70. Uh, you got to know uh, Dick Wolf, the creator of this discipleship learning adventure. Uh, now that now the late Dick Wolf, he, he is with Jesus, uh, having fought the dragons and finished the race. Uh, and now you're blessed to be a Light Raider yourself and carry forward and to some extent rebrand this world with the new games. And we'll we'll talk about that in a moment. But what led you specifically to decide, you know, I think this universe that I grew up with, like, I, th- I think it might need uh, a YA adventure novel in there set in the world uh, with all these uh, different place names, very traditional fantasy, you know, goblins and, um, you know, Christian allegory and stuff like that. Uh, how did you start to make the novel set in this world? So, I, you know, I had started working through um, the original Dragon Raid with my kids and some other kids, uh, my nieces and nephews, and had written some stories to continue the adventures. And I had sent those to the, the folks who uh, originally got me the box set, um, Rich and Joe, who are, are had been stewards of um, the, the Dragon Raid world for a long time. And uh, they, you know, through a, a series of events, put me put me in touch with with Dick Wolf. And, and what a massive blessing is, uh, you know, they had asked maybe you should uh, make these into stories, make these into novels um, to expand the reach of the world. And um, during that process, Dick was given only uh, about six months to live. And that was two and a half years ago, almost three years ago now. And yet God allowed Dick to stay with us long enough to do a, a full handoff of the series and even write a foreword for wolf soldier mm, which i love that forward a, a, a ton it just means so much and and i think that's all god um a, allowing dick to fully complete his work because that is a man who ran the race to win the prize that's fantastic and i, I did read that forward uh, i'm in the middle of reading wolf soldier right now which is book one in the the light raider academy trilogy uh, it's coming out, uh, I think, on the day we release this episode, uh, which is Tuesday, October 26th of, of 2021. Uh, this is a planned trilogy, correct? This is a uh, planned trilogy. Wolf Soldier, Bear Knight, and Lion Warrior, which uh, are the titles are based on roles that you could take on as a character in the world um, in the original 1980s game, and that you will continue to be able to take on as uh, the Light Raider Adventure Bible Study comes out next year, um, the, sort of the revised, what some folks call Dragon Raid 2.0, um, that uh, will, you'll be able to continue using these roles, and those are the, the basis for the titles of the book. So we went over some of the backstory of Dragon Raid in our episode 70, uh, including how a, a rather con manish sort of person uh, attempted to have the game and successfully had the game canceled back in the 1980s. So if you want more of that backstory, before the rebirth, go listen to episode 70. We'll have all those links in the show notes. What sorts of canon adjustments, if any, uh, did you make in, in going into this world and now having to adapt it from the game world? I mean, with the, with the title of those players, uh, but what, what other challenges did you have exploring this world in a different way where you've got to have uh, a more traditional, uh, fantastical plot? So there's there's a lot to unpack in that question, um, and uh, it was, you know, there were others that had uh, had ideas about the world and um, fleshed out ideas about the world and what should be changed over the you know 35 years between then and now. One of the key issues um, on the the original game world was the sort of sci-fi fantasy mashup, where the dark creatures, which represent various forms of sin in that world that you're fighting in the Dragonlands in the, in the game, um, those, we had sort of this Australia feel. So Eden again, which is where it all took place, uh, the, the, the planet of Eden again and the, and the continent of Telenia, 
that was almost like the Australia of the universe. And all, all the, the bad creatures were sent on spaceships that, that landed. And then, but then we were kind of going from there. We have creatures arriving on spaceships and then uh, living in a medieval Tolkien-esque fantasy world. Um, and so we sort of removed that sci-fi um, aspect. We okay. also wanted to make it clear um, that these are representations of sin. And so they are soulless corruptions of creation. And so that's corrupted nature. Um, and uh, that was one of those things where I went to the guys and I was like, hey, I'd rather do this as, you know, sort of soulless co corruptions of creation. They were like, yeah, so do, so do we. We thought of that a long time ago. It's the only solution. Uh, <laughs> so it's like, great. All right. Great minds. Um, but what we end up is so you have what, something else that I like about this is instead of doing the traditional, a lot of fantasy has traditional goblins, traditional orcs uh, that haven't really changed a whole lot from the Tolkien um, I I vision of those sort of creatures. But we have, we've radically changed how these things appear. So when you talk about a troll going, still drawing from uh, mythology and tradition, uh, a troll in our world is a corruption of some sort of nature um, in terms of trees, very solid nature, trees and rocks. So, so a forest troll has the appearance of a tree. It, it is an it is a rotted out animated tree, um, and uh, with a, there's a lot of muscular physique and power in that um, animated thing. You know, it's a big you know a big oak coming at you swinging an axe. That's the kind of thing we're, we're talking about, moving on roots like tentacles. Um, then you've got the, the stone trolls, rumble feet, uh, that are also like animated rock and, and things like that. Um, the, then you go to, to goblins, and we really went fungal-based with all the goblins. And so yes. goblins, you know, cave goblins are, 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 you know, we call it brittle-knit bone. Their, their internal structure is this very brittle um uh, so goblins in the game world were probably one of the weakest creatures that you faced um and we we created reasons about that so they're the brittle knit bone that forms their internal structure and their their flesh is corrupted fungus uh and and so you know it makes sense that you know a good a good solid sword blow will take one of these things out um whereas when you're fighting a tree troll or or a a, a rock troll those are those are a lot harder creatures to defeat based on the the way we've done it um and if i can keep going real quick here's the orcs the uh the, the orc creatures so we took that orc name expanded it out into what are the origins of the orc name and so in our world the the orcs are or creatures and so they are uh, like animated or and so you have iron orcs and you have coal orcs and the most dangerous that we can think of is the quicksilver orc uh and so these are things you know the iron orcs being sort of the 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 mainstay of the world the largest number that you'll see and when they're angry orcs in the original game world are all about rage and so when they when the rage flares within the orc you can see the the orange sort of lava-esque glow between their joints behind their eyes and in the and in the runes that they've carved into their own uh or like hide and so we we really tried to to take move beyond the boundaries of traditional fantasy and all of these creatures that we recreated for the new canon i'm seeing not only a a tabletop type game for this but a video game like it's very very visceral very um very vivid imagery there i also i love the idea of the more specific nature connections and the idea of nature being corrupted and, and then i guess manifesting in the forms of, of these creatures that's not just a tolkienish idea or something that's implicit in more uh, older mythology that tolkien was was inspired by but also as a very biblical concept I mean, going all the way back to genesis 3 and to feel that in the world of the story not just be taught that like as a straight allegory I think can be very effective in helping Christian fans to train our imaginations. Uh, I think sometimes uh, we get maybe more wrapped up in the idea of sin just being a human problem. It certainly is. Uh, and we need to repent and believe in Jesus to start fixing that problem. God will start fixing that uh, by way of the Holy Spirit. But also Genesis 3 and Romans 8 are very clear that humans were originally tasked to steward the earth. Uh, to expand Eden outward, to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion. 
uh, when humans went wrong uh, with the first rebellious choice in Genesis 3, our corruption, the sin corruption, started in our hearts and it spread out. And then we get thorns and thistles, or in the case of the Light Raiders world, uh, you get fungal goblins and uh, the trolls and all these other creatures. So that's, you know, you, you bring up something that uh, brings back to mind um, where we were in these discussions. We, I mean, this, we're talking three years back when we're coming up with this lore and, and what we're doing. And it was actually on my side, Dr. Gary Huckabee, who has been our theological advisor on all things Light Raider, that said almost the exact same thing. Oh, wow. So okay. I, you know, we I'm a good company to, then. That's gonna, awesome. How are we going to present these uh, dark creatures? What what do they represent? And he went straight to well, corruptions of creation. That's what the evil one does, takes what God created, which is good, uh, and and corrupts it. And one way to visualize that very in, in a strong way is to take the beauty of God's nature that he created, wonderful trees and, and things that we can even embellish in our fantastical world and show how the dragons in our world have corrupted them. I was way years ago watching the Lord of the Rings films with a, with a very brave family member who was not a fantasy fan. And I remember though, to this day coming to the moment in the first film, the fellowship of the ring, uh, it's not a moment in the book, but it is inspired by, as I remember Tolkien's rules for how the orcs came into being. And that's the wording used by Saruman. He's just bred up his fearsome uruk and he's pacing around it. And it's very cinematic. And he says, do you know how the orcs came into being? They were elves once. And I just remember this family member kind of sitting forward and going, oh, the orcs used to be elves. And Saruman explains how they were captured and tortured and mutilated, a ruined form of life. And that is so biblical, just the idea of this fallen creature, you know, that evil has corrupted and poisoned. And, and then you, you get that biblical idea reinforced, like you said, that Satan is not a creator. He's only a corrupter. Satan, yes. the devil's human sin, they can only poison and invert and distort uh, the good things that God has made. Precisely. Yes. Let's pause briefly for a side quest. We'll return to the main quest soon, but we must once again mention our second sponsor for this episode, which is the novel marketing podcast from Thomas Umstead Jr. As he says at the beginning of the show, rightly, this is the longest running book marketing podcast. For those who wish to create stories like Wolf Soldier or any other uh, fantasy or fiction or books for that matter, novel marketing applies to the creation of these stories, whereas Lorehaven is more about exploring them once they're done. Uh, there's some overlap between the creators and the fans. And in this case, we're emphasizing uh, Thomas's uh, really good episode, The Ten Commandments of Book Marketing, uh, one of my favorites. I was enjoying this even before he was a sponsor. So we're going through each one of these book marketing steps, including commandment number seven, thou shalt weigh thine options before investing in marketing. James R. Rubart, if you're listening, um, it's, a, it's a complete tribute uh, to your dulcet tones, good sir. In sum, this seventh commandment of book marketing is about the wisdom that successful authors must practice in order to understand their limits, the resources that God has given them, and the fact that you can't just throw money at something that doesn't work uh, and expect it to work. Uh, for example, Thomas mentions uh, the uselessness, the frivolity of trying to buy a billboard uh, to promote a book. Usually highway drivers are not at that time or ever uh, in the mood to go buy a book. Uh, even if you're stuck in traffic, uh, a book is the last thing on your mind. And that's one example of uh, some, uh, some of the uh, less wise choices that you can make uh, when you're determining your options to figure out what's going to work best to sell you books. This, once more, as with the previous commandments, is about wisdom. It's about being a good steward of your time and your money uh, and managing the costs that authors must manage, uh, particularly if they're independent authors who have to make these decisions on their own. Some authors, Thomas says, are time poor and cash rich. Others are vice versa. You can learn more about that in the Ten Commandments of Book Marketing, uh, the episode at the Novel Marketing Podcast. And I definitely encourage you to subscribe to the podcast. If you're in a mood to go create some fantasy of your own, find that at authormedia.com and the Novel Marketing Podcast is there or look for Novel Marketing on your streaming service. Of course, get all the links as well uh, in the uh, show notes for episode 85 of Fantastical Truth. Or you can go to lorehaven.com slash podcast sponsors. So I'm looking forward to finding out how our heroes uh, in Wolf Soldier uh, begin to 
not necessarily uncorrupt, uh, but uh, but bring the light into these dark places. And I'm what is it now? Ten chapters in. Uh, so hoping to finish uh, maybe even by release date. And then in that case, we'll be able to have a review up at lorehaven.com. I, I think I'm going to write it. We'll see how that goes. Uh, we have lots of, uh, of review team members. Uh, and you say that the next two titles, you've already chosen the titles, uh, as far as you know, uh, for, for books two and three. It's it's Bear, Knight, and, and Lion. What was that? Warrior. Okay. Okay. Will you still be able to play as these archetypes uh, in the future versions of the game as it's turning from Dragon Raid to Light Raiders? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And those were, you know, the I think uh, for a lot of folks, those were some of the most popular roles that, that people chose because you got um, an animal companion, a talking animal companion. Uh, so once you reached a certain level in the game and earned that right, then the the adventure master, uh, as, as Dick wrote in his sort of rules for how to do the storytelling, would say you contrive a way that this this animal and your character meet uh, and, and the player's character meets. And so you introduce it as part of the story and those two uh, come together and then become uh, boon companions as they fight the evil and do battle for restoration. And that's mm. another the key of what the light Raiders job is, is, is rescuing the lost of bringing back the uh, rescuers creations in in restoration and the starlot so you see on the cover of wolf soldier they're in the uh just in the in the embellishment just below the title wolf soldier there is a, a purple jewel and the purple jewel also makes an appearance in the pommel of the sword in uh that that connor ends up carrying and you can read the book to see why and how that sword comes to him but the the starlot was created for the game as is the dice they used d10 dice and we continue to use these these beautiful d10 dice from a company called game science and they're gem dice they're acrylic you can see through them and because of their shape as a d10 when you hold them up to the light and look point to point you see a star inside oh, so dick incorporated wow. that into the whole lore of the world but one of the be most beautiful parts to me is how he made it a representation, a, a, a star lot is the token of a light raider. And the way they came to be in the story is on the day that the rescuer sort of returned and, the, and, and sort of the representation, the allegorical representation loosely of the resurrection, this great mountain range of uh, in, originally in the story, the peaks of the new beginning, which we now call the celestial peaks, rose up. And the dragons did not, you know, as as a as a, a way of protecting uh, the body, um, uh, the the light raiders and and the new um, uh, the, what we call the Keladan and the twice born in the world. And so the dragons wanted to stop this. They wanted to get to these people. And so when they saw the mountains rising, they they flew in in mass to uh, attack. Uh, but they and they kept climbing, climbing. The peaks rose and the dragons flew higher and snow began to blow and the dragons began to spend their fire uh, in a desperate effort to stop this. And that fire, that dragon fire, which is a corruption of the High One's creation, froze in the snowstorm into these crystals that became the starlots. And so it represents taking what the evil one has corrupted and God is able to reclaim it and fashion it into something new and beautiful. And that's what the star lots represent. So it's one of the pieces of the story that I just really love. Amen. Preach. That, that's, a, that's a tangible reminder of what could otherwise seem a, a very biblical abstract, which leads me to another thought. I didn't come in thinking this, but just while you were talking, I was, uh, I was thinking about the objection that many fans sometimes have to what they would term allegory. Christian fans know that Tolkien said he did not like allegory. I believe the word Tolkien used for it was despise. He said he despised allegory in all its forms. Lewis was not, uh, did not find it so despicable, but is also famous for saying that he didn't fancy Narnia as an allegory, but as a supposal, particularly when you think about Aslan. And as a result, Pilgrim's Progress aside, uh, some Christian fans, I think, have been trained to just back away slowly from allegory going, uh, that's not the best kind of story, uh, kind of a prejudgment. And I'm, I'm, I'll toss you a question in a moment, but I was just thinking, you know, personally, I'm not opposed to allegory. I think that people might get uh, confused about the purpose of allegory, but also some of the 
not well done allegories that I've read just over spiritualize everything. They're constantly winking and whispering to the audience. This isn't real. This world isn't real. You know, this, this creature, whatever, like that's not really that creature. That's just Jesus or that's just Satan. Narnia doesn't do that wherever you might describe it as allegorical. And I think a good fantasy with allegorical elements won't do that. It's going to be just as physical and yet determinedly symbolic as you're describing here. Um, any thoughts about that and just the idea of allegory? Oh, no, it's a big, big discussion. And understanding as a writer when allegory is appropriate, when it is not. Um, strict allegory just becomes a one-for-one swap and you yes. lose the storytelling. So for instance, in the Paris Betrayal, the Paris Betrayal is a reimagining of the story of Job in uh, spy fiction, you know, looking at Job as a spy left out in the cold. Well, in the Paris Betrayal, if I had done to a strict allegory to Job and his friends and one acquaintance, as I've been you know, corrected, I'm not allowed to call them uh, uh, all his friends in simplification, that, that will earn you uh, a, a bad review. So, uh, but strict allegory would have made the story predictable. It would have made the story dry. Um, so when we're, when we're creating fiction, sticking to allegory, um, becomes an oversimplification. So I like to think in terms of representation. Yes. So there are pieces of story that represent things clearly. And even in Tolkien, and especially in Lewis, there are pieces of those stories that are clear representations of aspects of the Christian life, of aspects of our world, of darkness in our world. But when we try to make things a straight allegory, one for one swap, moment by moment within a story, we, we kind of lose the, uh, the fun and the joy of storytelling, both for the writer and the reader. That's immensely clarifying. And it occurs to me also that in a sense, the Christian, literally the Christ-like person, is meant to be, in a sense, an allegory for Jesus. Allegory just being understood as this is like that. Well, the Christian is meant to be a person upon whom you can look and say, she is like Jesus. He is like Jesus. But we know it's not a strict one-to-one -one correspondence, obviously. We're not exactly like Jesus. He is the ideal, the real person, the God-man that we are supposed to imitate. Uh, we're supposed to, your word, represent Jesus to the world, and yet things go wrong. We have not only our own personalities, uh, but also plenty of sinful glitches. We are not like Jesus, even if we're meant to be. And I think you're right that the best allegory is not going to have that one-to-one -one correspondence. I've seen some people gamely trying to justify or appreciate Narnia, and then they will go through the story and they will say, well, Professor Kirk's mansion is like the church, or Aslan's tent is like the tabernacle. Or Susan and Lucy are like Mary and Martha. And I go, yes, but also no, Susan and Lucy are like any believer, uh, any, any Christian. You know, the representation is there of not specific Bible characters one to one, but of Jesus. You know, Susan's horn may represent prayer, but it may also represent just any call to help, you know, for, for any person, you know, because it's not just a God who, or Aslan who responds to Susan's horn. Uh, it's Peter who then runs and kills the wolf, uh, another type of wolf soldier, by the way, completely different from yours. <laughs> yeah. So, and again, like these, and this affects things like canon. So one of the, and, and uh, I need to, to send a note to Rich. Rich, if you're listening, hopefully I've responded to the email by now, but uh, Rich, who's had some great ideas, uh, he created, or he, it was his idea to change the name to the, uh, the, the, the Christ figure, the person who represents Christ in the stories uh, in the original game was the overlord of many names. Um, aside from being a mouthful, changes in semantics in our, in our current day, things like that, that needed to be changed. And Rich's idea was the rescuer of souls shortened in the stories to the rescuer. Mm -hmm. And that's what it is. That's what it is in the books. So thank you, Rich. Um, but those are one of the things that we change about that is when you, when you open a 1980s box set, there's a little pamphlet inside. If you get one of the originals that says the, the, uh, and it actually might be in the light writer handbook it says the overlord of many names is Jesus. And what Dick meant by that was the overlord of many names represents Christ because even Lewis, um, far be it from any of us 
to try to create a new Christ. Right. To try to create new adventures for for Christ and predict and say what Christ will do. So as we go back to that word representation, we have a character in our stories. Tolkien had characters in his stories that represented the divine. Um, and we these are representations, but certainly they are not um, a one-for-one -one swap with uh, God or Christ. Um, and that's one of the reasons in the stories, uh, you'll notice in Wolf Soldier that I don't capitalize the pronouns for um, the, the Christ figure or the God figure, uh, the high one, the rescuer, the creator. I capitalize those pronouns proper names as is normal, but I don't capitalize pronouns because they are not actual in our world divine um, beings. They're not Christ. It's not God. It's not the Holy Spirit. And so I, I'm, I'm very careful with that down to how I present even things like the pronouns. That makes sense. And, and with Tolkien, I suppose he, he would not say, for example, that Frodo or Aragorn or Gandalf are Christ figures. But they kind of are. It's kind of split three ways there. You almost get a prophet, priest, king type motif there. But more directly, I would call them Christ figure figures. The Christian They're, in real life is the Christ figure and characters who imitate Christ are like Christ figure figures. They're what we call types. Yes, so, exactly. Uh, they, they, so Job, for instance, David, they are types of Christ in yeah. scripture. And so I would say that Bilbo is a type, that Aragorn is a type. Uh, of Christ in various ways, but none of them are the are are full representations. And that understanding has full biblical precedent because the Apostle Paul, for example, could look back, inspired by the Holy Spirit, talk about the rock that gave the water in the Old Testament, and say that rock is like a type of Christ. Uh, the other gospel or the other um, uh, epistle author can look back and say, okay. Jesus was also like Melchizedek. You know, nobody may have ever thought that before. But then also the comparisons to David and other types, which are flawed. They're not a direct one-to-one -one representation of Christ uh, any more than modern fiction would uh, show like Superman as a as a type. Oh, he's a Christ figure. Like no, as they say in the movie, like he's he's just a guy trying to do the right thing. But everybody can look at this hero and say, well, that's kind of like Jesus. But don't push it too far. You don't want to right. chase after the reflection in a broken glass and miss the real Jesus that you can only find presented in his fullness uh, in the scriptures. Absolutely. Yes. And, you know, lots of especially fantastical stories are going to have that chosen one figure. And we just have to be careful how far we take that. And again, going back to nothing should be straight allegory. Right. Right. Well, not even Jesus presented straight allegory when he taught his parables and introduced them with the words, the kingdom of heaven is like. I understand that is like to apply to the entire parable. You're not supposed to look at the parable and say, well, where's the kingdom in here? You know, is it the room? You know, is the, is the, the, the wealthy landowner and like a direct one-to-one -one correspondence to the father? Like, no, Jesus is saying this whole parable is telling you something about the kingdom. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Absolutely. And we, we do that, don't we? We try to break these things down and we get, we over, I think yeah. sometimes we overanalyze and we do the same thing to our authors. Dear, dear readers, don't do that to your poor authors. Uh, yeah, don't. <laughs> Fiction is if bigger. If you hold them to a strict standard of allegory, they will disappoint you no matter what. It's all Origins' fault, you know, or, yeah. or who, whichever uh, early church father. Um, I'm sure he was uh, very nice uh, to his uh, neighbors and pets and everything. But nonetheless, whether it was Origin or someone else, you'd read the parable of the Good Samaritan and you'd say, well, Jericho is a one to one correspondence for this, and the road represents this. And I mean, the, the priest and the Levite are kind of obvious. They represent a priest and the Levite. Uh, but the two silver coins or the two coins that the Samaritan paid the innkeeper, like those represent the law and the prophets. Like, eh, you're taking it too far. Like, that's, that's not what Jesus meant. Jesus is responding with the story to the question, who is my neighbor? The story provides the answer to those who have ears to hear. Yes, absolutely. So for your story world, uh, my final question here as we start to wrap up is what is next for Light Raiders? It's been a few months since we last spoke on Fantastical Truth. Uh, you've been having the Kickstarters. You've been putting out the card game information as well as the book. Uh, this thing is in full swing. So what updates can you provide uh, not only about the, the release dates of the next installments in the Light Raider Academy series, uh, but also for what's going on with the Light Raiders game proper and its uh, various spinoffs? Once, uh, before I forget, we 
Um, if you're hearing this on 26 October, then join us on 28 October. We decided to uh, hold the launch of the book a couple of days um, so that we could uh, make it available to as many people as possible. So we're doing a sort of an all day event on Facebook on the Light Raider Academy f Facebook page. And we are doing a live Instagram event on the James R. Hannibal page and then uh, James R. Brown, who did those wonderful maps inside the book, uh, will be joining us from the Light Ritter page and Morgan Bussey uh, will be joining us to talk about uh, her new book, Secrets in the Mist, as well. So all of that happening on the uh, 28th of October, both on Facebook and Instagram. So watch those pages. Then we just completed our second consecutive uh, Kickstarter with the game. So, so we've now had two consecutive uh, successful Kickstarters, one to launch the First Watch card game, which is our scripture memory and application game set in the world. You'll find some of the verses from the card deck in Wolf Soldier, and you'll be able to, they're, they're spoken in Wolf Soldier in the Elder Tongue, so it's sort of like an Easter egg thing trying to determine, okay, what verse was that? Uh, and then if you can figure that out, then you can look on the cards and see the fantasy effects on the cards being experienced by the characters in the books. So we create sort of interactive thing there. We then um, also have the, the Starlots board game set in the Light Raiders world. We just completed that Kickstarter and we're going into production. You're going to learn about all of these things at lightraiders.com on our websites. And if you missed the Kickstarters, you can still pre-order. Uh, we actually com have completed all of our first watch Kickstarter orders already. So you can actually order those on the website and you can back order the star lots because we were funded and we are actually going into production. And then the last crazy thing that we're doing is we're also doing an online reader directed origin story for the Light Raiders world. And this is where the rescuer enters the world, going back to some of that uh, representation. The rescuer uh, lived in his time as a blacksmith. And so there's a lot of blacksmith um, terms and, and uh, smithing discussion or metaphor in the Light Raider world. Uh, and so we actually are going to see in this origin story how that sort of, sort of came about. But the readers are taking part in that origin story. So I write a chapter. It's being posted on woodridge.org. The latest chapter just came out. Chapter four is on up, up on woodridge.org on their blog. And at the end of the chapter, you can choose which direction Kaya will take. Um, I'll tell you that the 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 direction that Kaya is probably going to take in, in uh, chapter four seems pretty obvious. We'll have to see. But in the past, choices that she's made are not so easy. Uh, and when the readers make that choice for me, then I write the next chapter and see where the story goes. Now that sounds like fun. It's a it's a it's a crowdsourced choose your own adventure. Now that that, exactly. that sounds awesome. So that main website that people need to visit is lightraiders.com. You can also go to jamesrhannibal.com, but uh, I think it sounds like you really want to keep the focus on lightraiders.com as well as some of the other links. Can they find you too uh, on Facebook and Instagram just by looking for James R. Hannibal, or are there other links we need to state there? No, if they if they Google James R. Hannibal, um, they can find me. If they Google Light Raiders, they can find uh, all of our stuff. We should be the first thing that pops up there. Um, but yes, uh, right now the focus is on lightraiders.com. I need to go in and, and do some updates on jamesrhannibal.com. But you can still find all the information you need there. Awesome. And uh, do you have a release window for Bear Night, assuming that we can still print stuff when it's time for that to be unleashed? Uh, uh, right now projected is February, 2023. Okay. Okay. So about, about a year and a half away. So, well, hopefully that gives you plenty of time to keep going with that world. I'm so glad that, uh, light Raiders gets to make the jump into basically this is kind of a multimedia franchise going on here. So if you've enjoyed dragon raid, you're going to love this update. Uh, it's a great tool for families to explore the gospel together uh, to not just be entertained, but to train. It is a discipleship learning adventure, which I love, by the way, that term discipleship. And I understand that the best Christian made fantastic stories are not just means of entertainment. They're not just a story, but they are tools, not direct allegory. It's not all the same tool for every problem, uh, but discipleship. And that is what Christians are called to do. It's Jesus's parting commandment when he went up at the, uh, at the Great Commission is what he gave there at, at his ascension. 
And we cannot understand how to reclaim or recover creation without understanding that discipleship quest that our Lord, our rescuer has given us. James, thank you so much uh, for arriving here. Um, we will send you then back on your magic wheelchair and then uh, hopefully, yeah, pray for James. He's got a lot to do uh, even while he's recovering from all of his questing. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to throw one more thing out there. I'm not Do sure so. how much I can say, but uh, yes. watch our sites because there is a youth retreat coming in March of next year. So keep your calendars open and watch for the for a youth retreat where Light Raiders will be uh, a big part of that with some storytelling um, and some and, and a deep dive uh, or a deeper dive into the discipleship of of the games. You heard it here, folks. The Light Raider Academy is real. And I'm imagining this mountain fortress out there somewhere in the wilderness of Colorado. I just made that part up. I'm, I'm not putting that into James's mouth, but yeah, get the links uh, from our show notes for episode 85. Go to lorehaven.com slash podcast. If you're not seeing them show up in your podcast player, which you should. James, thanks so much for returning. We look forward to finding out what missions are next for you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a blessing. It was great to reconnect with James Wheelchair or otherwise. Uh, do pray for his recovery. The man has places to go, quests to fulfill, dragons to slay, events to plan, uh, and games to assemble. And being sidelined in a wheelchair, even temporarily, I'm sure, uh, is not where he would like to be right now. So definitely pray that God will encourage him creatively, uh, even during this time of recovery. And uh, then eventually he will be back out there flying with dragons or flying on dragons, whichever comes first. Uh, let's move from there to our comm station. We've got a few fantastic fans who fed back to previous uh, Fantastical Truth episodes, uh, including listener Jessica, who responded uh, fairly quickly to episode 82. That's the one with LG McCary and her newly released uh, suspense contemporary social drama novel, uh, That Pale Host. Jessica said, quote, Ten minutes into the discussion of the novel, I purchased That Pale Host. Psychological thrillers are always intriguing, and Christian fiction definitely needs more of them. A good example of this genre is The Three E by Ted Decker. A pause quote there. I know it says three, but every time I read The Three E, which puts the digit three in the middle of the word, uh, substituting for that first E, I hear it in my head as Three Three E. So that's why I read it that strange way. Resume quote. It was the first novel I read that showed me that Christian fiction exists outside of the Amish and Hallmark world. It was an eye-opener, and it set me on my path to speculative fiction in the world of Christian literature. End quote. That describes my sensibilities as well. I can't necessarily speak for Zach, but I think we're on a similar wavelength there. Uh, Christianity is not just limited to those pre-cleaned worlds. Uh, you know, all blessings to those who enjoy a world that's a little bit simpler a little bit happier, a little bit more prone to uh, misunderstandings and social drama instead of evil dark lords trying to take over the world. Uh, I think reality includes all of those things. And so Christian-made fiction should also touch on all of those things. And that's what I really liked about uh, L.G. McCary's book. Uh, Laura has captured a realistic portrait of the Christian world, the evangelical world of churches and gatherings and just the challenges of parenting and uh, being part of a married couple. Uh, but this is also a world that is haunted by the numinous, uh, not just bad memories or sin, uh, but literal, it would seem, actual ghosts. Uh, the story does a great job of following our heroine as she's trying to confront all of those things, uh, even in a world that really, really resembles our own. It's the best kind of social drama uh, we said in our review, and I definitely recommend you pick up uh, L.G. McCary's book, That Pale Host. Uh, disclosure, of course, uh, she also writes for Lorehaven and does social media, but it doesn't hurt that she wrote a really great story as well. It'd be a little bit awkward to endorse it otherwise. So we endorse it because it's great. Our next note here is from at Caleb Axon. Uh, that's his Twitter handle. Uh, he liked episode 84 uh, with Christianity Today news editor Daniel Silliman, uh, who had written a nonfiction book about fiction called Reading Evangelicals. Pro tip, if you write nonfiction, that's how you get onto this podcast. It's got to be about fiction. And that's how I also get away with it because I helped write the nonfiction book about fiction called The Pop Culture Parent. This is what at Caleb Exxon said about uh, that episode 84. He said, quote, so this is kind of fascinating. Christian fiction after I stopped reading Christian fiction and how it helped shape a culture that I drifted away from during that same time. 
They don't consider secular market Christian work like that of C.S. Lewis to be Christian in the sense discussed here. End quote. I think he's right in that last part. Uh, I would add that that is because Lewis's fiction, like Tolkien and G.K. Chesterton and other authors before them, uh, they were speaking into a world that was very positive about Christianity. You didn't have to divide the publication world or the bookmaking world into Christian-made or non-Christian-made. Uh, there could be plenty of overlap uh, in addition to denominations publishing really distinctive stuff uh, for their specific set. You could get people like C.S. Lewis who just wrote books. And I think a lot of authors uh, would like to go back there and a lot of readers would like to go back there because they might feel less awkward uh, given that Christian made fiction now still has a lingering reputation for being shallow or all about the romance and the prairies and all of that. It might feel like we could go back to that old world. I don't think we can. Uh, that's not what Caleb said. That's just my opinion. I think that culture has changed so drastically that it's not just a matter of Christian creators or Christian fans really, really, really wanting uh, to get Christian influenced books coming out from secular presses. Actually, Thomas Umstadt again uh, makes that point in several episodes of his podcast is that if you look over the history, even going back a few decades, it was secular publishers not seeing a place for Christian made stories in their publishing houses. It uh, wasn't that Christians withdrew from those places so much as those places withdrew from the Christians. So the Christians went and they started their own publishing houses. And here we are. And now I think even Christian publishing is due for a kind of reboot. Uh, the big publishing houses are increasingly being bought by the secular ones. So we may have the same issue all over again. I think we ought not be sentimentalist about the challenges that Christians face in this world. I don't think it's just a matter of Christians deciding to be really, really good and really, really winsome, and then the world will like us. Jesus told us not to expect that the world will like us. That's entitlement. We can't expect that. Why would they like us? We believe crazy stuff. We should be winsome and Christ-like and gracious while we spread the gospel, not because it will impress the people. It doesn't really matter what their reaction is. Our motive should be to impress Jesus. We want to be like our Savior. We want to imitate his holiness. So that's why I advocate, and that's why Lorehaven advocates Christian-made fantastical fiction wherever you find it, directly from the author, publishing it on her, by herself or by himself or from a small publisher or even from some of the big Christian publishers, which are still out there, and we still want to like what they do. So you may have thoughts about that or about uh, James R. Hannibal's Wolf Soldier or any of those previous topics. Do share those with us. Uh, I happen to pick up on some of this stuff because it tags at Lorehaven on Twitter. You can also find Lorehaven on Instagram and search us on Facebook as well. We've got the Lorehaven Guild Hall group on there where we share all kinds of fun stuff. And we'll also be sharing news about a certain big project that we have in the works, Lord willing to launch in early 2022. So. Keep your eyes posted in case you have a mind to join that quest. You can also get us by email, podcast at lorehaven.com, or post a comment in response to these show notes at lorehaven.com slash podcast. Next on Fantastical Truth, Halloween lurks ahead. And scarily enough, we have not yet talked about this topic on Fantastical Truth. Yes, we do have thoughts on Halloween. I, for one, am still hoping, even late in the month, to get my big dragon inflatable on the lawn in time for the trick-or-treaters. But there's one kind of spooky decoration that I actually don't find very whimsical or fun. I find it flippant and unserious, and I think it's an insult to people who are trying to confront the sobering realities of darkness and death. Meanwhile, as we confront the realities of our world, Let's find the best in fantasy. The goblins and dragons and all of those things can represent sin and suffering and darkness and the corruption in our world, even as Christ figures or Christ figure figures or Christ types or any heroes in fantasy can help represent Jesus to us as we continue to seek and find his fantastical truth 